Okay, my friends, here it is. The Saturday morning live stream at the Garden Lager Viking headquarters. Zone 5 slash 6, Northern Indiana. Yes, Wild Bill, I'm right here. Have no fear, my friends. When I was in grade school, I had 11 and a half years of perfect attendance. I know, now it seems insane, but I tell you that to show you how dedicated I am when I believe in something. So, <clears throat> uh, okay guys, let us know where you're at. Let us know how far before the last frost is it for you guys. Here it is one month before the last frost. And so we have all kinds of things that are happening right now. And I wanna show you on the forecast uh, why it is important to heed the advice of seasoned gardeners when they say to wait because so many people just jump the gun. And I'm serious, that's the number one issue with starting seeds and with transplanting and all kinds of stuff is that they're impatient. So, so many people are already hitting me up. Nate, what do you do about frost cover? How, how do you keep the frost off of your, your seedlings? I don't, I just wait until the time is right. But so many people are now scrambling because look, all right, uh, we have, so, Look, uh, it, it's been quite warm the, the past several weeks, uh, or well, this whole winter really. But then now look, see, it's gonna be 75, 75, 70, 70, whoops. And then the, uh, and the lows were in the 50s and the 40s and stuff, but then look, see, now it's gonna get back down to 35, 35, 32, and beyond, I bet it's gonna get below freezing again. All right, so this always happens, okay, even though it's like a false, uh, springtime, it's like, oh, it's 75 and sunny right now. Let's get our tomatoes out. Let's put all of our cucumbers. Let's do all this stuff. Wrong, because the last frost date is the last frost date. And so you'll save yourself all kinds of trouble. And like I always say, you gain so much more by waiting until the soil is warm because everything has to do with temperature. To those of you guys that have um, experimented around over the years and maybe you're into fermenting things and so, uh, or you're growing microgreens and so you know how important the temperature is. The temperature is just everything. When as far as like when we're doing um, kefir, the temperature is astronomically important. I mean, it makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, in the overall product and the end, you know, the rate at which everything happens. And so with microgreens as well, if you're trying to grow the microgreens in your cold, you know, dingy basement and stuff, and it's 50 degrees in the wintertime, they're growing slow, as opposed to if you have a soil uh, or like a heat mat or something at 70, 75, boom, they're growing super fast. So we, um, it's advantageous, you know, to wait until the soil is warmed for so many reasons. So if a lot of you guys have the heavy mulch system, which of course you all should for the most part, then um, you're gonna want to rake back that mulch. If you're in a place like Northern Indiana, you're gonna wanna rake back that mulch so that it uh, can get warmed by the sun. This is important because if we have this much mulch on our soil right now, it's gonna keep it cool well into spring. Yes? Uh, guys, I forgot to do the sound check today okay here's the sound check i just got to make sure it's working german butterball yeah what did i say for the sound check guys so uh let's see what you guys are growing what zone you're in uh let us see here Shay Dixon says, was just watching your beginner composting video yeah that one's getting popular uh at the moment Okay, good, thank you guys. Terry, Pilar, Jay, Signal, yes, RK, thank you. Pam, Michelle, um, <laughs> VA Green, yeah, funny. Okay, good, good, good. We got the, uh, the um, sound check. Claire, listen to you. Uh, okay, so the, the um, what was I talking about here? Yeah, the composting video has gotten very um, a lot of attention lately. And it's probably because most people are totally overwhelmed and sick and tired of how complicated the internet and YouTubers tend to make composting. It, it is such a simple thing. 
Uh, and, and yet, if you like look up how to compost, there's all these rules that, you know, well, you have to add, you can, there's a huge long list of what you cannot add to the compost pile. And then a big list of what you can, and then what ratio you're supposed to put it in, and then uh, you have to turn it every so often, and you don't have to do any of that. Spoiler alert, nature composts everything by simply putting it on top of the soil. That's how everything decomposes. So to a degree, we can mimic this, all right? So uh, it's very simple, and nature composts everything. Your entire body will be composted at some point. And so it's slow compost. Now I understand the people that are trying to do like specific, you know, hot compost changes the game. If you're trying to do hot compost, that changes things. But I recommend doing slow, you have both. You have a slow compost pile going, uh, where you're throwing stuff and then harvesting from the bottom, which works really well. Once you get the pile going, uh, it doesn't take like years for it to break down. Once you've got a biologically active pile, man, and you've got a nice black bin that, that gets the heat, that stuff breaks down pretty quick. Uh, so I put everything in there, meat, bones, eggs, milk, cheese, uh, all that kind of stuff, all right? And it all decomposes because I put in other stuff as well. And I keep like some straw or some leaves or something so that I can, after it, once it gets a whole layer of the greens or the food scraps, then I'll put a, a layer, a thin layer of the straw. Now, I do have to admit though that, um, oh, Brian Airy, don't even get me started, says it's crazy how many fake garden and cooking videos there are. It's insane, it's like an epidemic. And once you know what you're doing, then you know and you can see how fake they are, but I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole at the moment. Uh, so I, I must confess though, now with the um, composting, I do compost like that, but it has attracted rats. So that's the main problem. Uh, so if you can keep the rats out of it, which I've got several different ways to do that, and I'm gonna make a video probably coming up soon, uh, or this year on the rat-proof composting options because uh, that is the main drawback. When I was comp, if you compost just plant leaves from the garden and browns, then you're not gonna get uh, rats. But these rats here are uh, very, very vicious and they dig in. And the problem is that they dig underneath and they just dig out huge piles of the, the compost and just let it get rained on and everything. I mean, rats are terrible for it. Uh, so I've developed some traps for them. Sorry, but nobody likes a rat. So, um, yeah, and, and we're not here in the countryside like we were in the mountains in Northern California. Then the predators, there were so many predators, the rats were just not an issue. Even though we had Norwegian wood rats, they didn't get into the stuff because there was foxes and hawks and coyotes and all kinds of things. So, um... Let's see here. So the, uh, yes, Queen RB German, Butterball, that's right, I said that. So here it is, the delicious, amazing German Butterball that I harvested in September, and it is still rock hard. Just now starting to um, sprout, chip. Uh, but this, this one survived by accident because it was at the bottom of the pile. I ate, I ate the ones like this. Uh, and then the ones, most of the seed ones I have are going to be like this, the tiny little ones. So these have gone, um, even though these, I'll just take this opportunity to show you guys the difference. Remember, when you're chitting your potatoes, uh, this, this up, well, I'll, I'll get into that. I'll get into that in a minute. I want to see what you guys are talking about. Um, Dav says, uh, I've, I'm done with overly complicated hot compost. Too much work for someone with a day job. Just keep cold composting and one day you'll be ahead of the game and have a surplus. Let nature do the work. That's exactly right. I mean, I cold compost primarily and uh, I've got more compost than I know what to do with right now. I mean, I've got like, I'm having to empty out trash containers of it and there's like piles of it and so I put a tarp over it because you don't want the compost to get rained on. Remember that. The nutrients in the compost are very water soluble. And so that's why it's so easy to make a, a seedling fertilizer, a compost extract, by just dunking it in there a few times, boom. So much of the good stuff is, is water soluble, comes right off. And so um, for that reason, we do not want our compost to be exposed to rain. 
Uh, we want to keep it moist, but we don't want it to like get rained on. So put the tarp over it, whatever you have to do, because here in another couple weeks, once things are planted, uh, we're going to start the aerated compost teas. And so we will be using compost all summer for the teas as well. Well, many different things. You'll see. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the um, Val says, the government here in Arizona signed a bill, make it illegal to compost humans. What do you think about that? Oh, making it legal to compost humans. Um, I mean, that's what we did for th millennia, millennia. Uh, only very recently do we have the bizarre practice where each body is essentially mummified. You know, embalm them with a bunch of chemicals and bury them in a box, in a concrete box. So where are they going to go? Or, I mean, it, it just, they have to break down. You, you, are, you are, but see, the whole concept, the whole hang up with, with uh, uh, decomposing bodies uh, just sort of illustrates our disconnection in this modern society, our disconnection from the natural cycle of things uh, and, and how, and our fear of death, you know, and so there's nothing more natural than death. And the body will return to the soil from which it came. The minerals, everything. Soil, sunlight. Soil, sunlight. What you eat is soil and sunlight and life force. And so you are soil that has been rearranged and temporarily animated with the breath of life. And there will come the time, poof, when you'll return to soil and become something else again. And then eventually become stars and all. The cycle never ends. And so uh, it's very fitting that our modern society tries to break that cycle, you know, by mummifying everyone, essentially. But uh, I think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, compost. I mean, it, it has to be done in like a, um, you know, clinical, legal manner, of course. But absolutely. So, yeah, Jamie Copeland says, I love the idea of naturally decomposing bodies. Our techniques now are just strange. They are strange, yes, and they reflect the total disconnect from the natural cycles of life. Um, there is a company now I've seen, I don't know in what state this is, but uh, that will do that for your loved one. It's like a burial thing, and they will uh, put them in this type of cocoon thing, the body, and uh, then attach it to a tree of, of specific variety, and uh, they will bury it with the tree on top and so that the body will nourish the tree and become life again i mean if we're going to have a cer if we're going to have a a um a process or a ceremony that would be the one i mean have it become a fruit tree or something you know that 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 uh will give life and you'll see bees coming around i mean think of that the loved one is nourishing that tree and you see the bees that are coming and enjoying and you just sit there and you watch the flowers uh of the fruit and how the pollinators are coming and sustaining their life and the sunshine and you would feel the spirit of the person it would be wonderful so th that is um really ideal in my mind um so <clears throat> queen rb says holy moly i need some seed german butterballs yeah yeah if you can find them german butterballs are the way to go uh and they're very dense and very full of flavor. So think think like classic German potato salad. That, that's what they are like. You know, how it's like real dense and buttery and delicious. Oops. Um, yes. So the, uh, let's see here. I want to see what you guys are talking about. Lily Gonzalez, hello, my friend. Says she's been working overtime, but she's here now in Cool Spring, Florida. Nice. Um, B. Hendrick says, rain will rinse away your premium nutrients. Yes, you need to have good soil structure and you need to have um, uh, lots of aggregates in the soil so that things can get carried down and kept. And you need to have living roots in the soil. Um, but if we just till up the earth and put down our nutrients and it rains and it pools up and it runs off. Yes, definitely terrible. Um, Terry Judd says, I want to be fertilizer for a nice pecan tree so that I can eventually smoke a nice ham. Nice. <laughs> um, Miss Shade says, does it matter what kind of diet they had in life? Well, I know. 
Um, if you're taking all kinds of gnarly things or if you're genetically modified human, then uh, we don't know. We don't know. But I still say eventually the soil is going to take care of it. Everything, the, the microbes will take care of everything. Microbes run this planet, just so that you know. Microbes run this planet. They run your body. They run the process. They run it. So, um, let's see here. Grandma Zoo says, Nate, the J Dom YouTube videos are interesting and very funny with the translations. They do not hold back. Between you and them, I am set. Yeah, those the J Dom channel is is nice. I mean, it's uh, their videos are nice and the humor from the translation. And I do believe that it's Young Sung Chow's son, J, J Dom founder's son, who is doing the translations. So imagine. I would imagine that's pretty funny between them. The way that he translates it and his dad doesn't really understand what he's saying, but he's translating it in the way that he feels like translating it. You know, I, I could see that being pretty funny. Uh, and you can feel the humor when you watch the videos. So I just felt the need to, you know, uh, to simplify everything for the Western audience, especially the quantities of stuff. Uh, it just all needed simplified. So, mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Queen RB says, starting basil today, tomatoes yesterday, kind of late, but hoping the new grow lights and heat mats will make them grow fast, along with worm castings. Yes, so you got it. Now, we are four weeks here before last frost, so uh, it's a little bit late, but not that big of a deal, especially for things like basil. Basil, I, I direct seed basil even up until July, late July. You can just direct seed basil and still get uh, a good crop. So yes, I have some basil that has started, but um, uh, I don't know exactly where you're at, Queen RB, but if you're in anywhere like Northern Indiana, you've got plenty of time for all of that stuff. So don't worry. And yes, if you're late to the game, heat mats will start things a lot faster. Like, look at this. Um, these, these onions, I had to take off the heat mat and put them outside, even though I've trimmed them three times already. Uh, so they're just getting a little bit unruly, but it's because I use the ultimate seedling fertilizer with that growth hormone and some of that fish fertilizer and they just go off the chain. They just can't stop growing. So uh, even though they've been trimmed three times and uh, these are the Weathersfield red, the long days. And so, yes, I know that they're too long, but man, it's only been a few days and they're already growing again. So we are going to plant these things out soon because... This year, um, you know, I have a particular way of hardening things off. So I just kind of wait until the forecast looks appropriate. And then once I take them outside, I just kind of leave them. You know, not in the full on sun, but I put them in a place where they're going to get only like four hours of direct sun. You know, in between like the sauna tent and the fence. You know, in a little spot where they're going to get a few hours of direct sun. Um, but they're not going to get blasted all day by the sun. So uh, that's very important. Now, I want to say, you guys, I, I'm going to make a short about this so that more people can know. But you, when you harden off your onion seedlings, once you put them outside, you leave them outside. I, I mean, as far as you can put them outside during the daytime and bring them back in before it gets dark. But once, because they're day length sensitive, so don't be leaving them outside sometimes and letting it get dark and then forgetting one day and then bringing it back in, that's going to disrupt their light cycle. So onions, once you put them outside, leave them outside and don't bring them back in. Uh, just make sure that they're shaded. Onions are incredibly cold hardy. So you don't, you really don't have to worry, um, uh, about the temperatures. Like I said, several years ago when I had planted, um, them on April 20th, we got a real hard freeze. It was like 19 degrees, 17 degrees actually, I think. And the onions were frozen solid. I went out there and I, I felt them and, and part of it busted off in my hand. That's how cold they were. And then when it warmed up, they thawed out and every one of them survived. So um, onions are very, very hardy. You just gotta make sure that you don't disrupt that daylight cycle, all right? So once you, everyone's like, well, yeah, but but they, uh, if you put the timer at 16 and 8, 16 hours of on and 8 hours of off, that's going to induce them to bulb because people are under the misconception that they bulb based upon just the hours of day length. Onions bulb based upon the detected changes in the day length. So 
long day onions, which you all already know, but repetition is key. Uh, long day onions put out all their vegetative growth as the days are getting longer until the summer solstice comes and the days begin getting shorter. And then they sense those changes after about a few days to a week, they sense those changes and then they stop the leaf production and begin rapid pace bulb production. And in like four weeks, they go from having no bulb to like a full size bulb. So, um, uh, so when you put them outside, they're going to, for like a day or two, they're going to be like, whoa, what is this? But then quickly they're going to sense that, uh, the days are getting longer. And so they're going to go right on and keep on growing. So when you're doing onions indoors, you always, when you're starting anything indoors, 16 hours on eight hours off, you never touch it unless you're trying to flower certain plants indoors. Mm hmm yes so oh yes jamie copeland says planted 140 yellow parma last week very excited yes they're gonna be great uh meyer lemon says nate should we use 45 percent shade cloth to harden off onions how long to harden off uh if you don't have a place like i was talking about in between like two tall structures or something then yes shade cloth would be great if you if they have to be in the full sun for several hours for all day shade cloth yes um now how long to harden them off that is totally up to you uh but onions are pretty hardy so mine have been outside for about five days now and once i put them out i left them in the full shade for like two days and then i brought them out into the uh like four hours five hours of direct sun for um the, the remainder so now it's like day five and they're perfectly fine they're growing like crazy and so i'm going to plant them here in the next few days and um just leave them in the full sun yeah uh, a lot of people see if you grow your transplants right the the hardening off is not that big of a deal so a lot of people you hear a lot of horror stories about hardening off because people didn't grow them right. They've got these sickly little tomato plants that are like got a seven inch stem on it and little tiny leaves up here. And they're like, oh, I didn't, it died when I put it outside. Well, of course it did. I mean, it's just weak all around. So you need to um, make sure that you have thriving seedlings. That's the key. That's the key. Um, Hanan Rafiq 13 says, how many types of JLF should I make to free myself of any kind of fertilizers? Well, that depends on what you are growing, uh, what your goals are, but definitely beyond any doubt, the fish fertilizer, the fish fertilizer and the ash fertilizer is very easy to make. Um, urine fertilizer. Those are all very easy. Definitely. If you need good, strong growth, um, and you will see the aerated compost tea is going to be a very, um, pretty much everything that you need, you know, depending on what kind of scale you're doing, there's lots of factors involved, but, um, and the everything fertilizer, you know, but if you're, if you're doing, if you're like a spinach farmer or if you're a beet farmer, then make a beet JLF or a spinach JLF. Definitely. So, um, you don't have to make that many different kinds. And then after several years, when, you're, when your soil is on point, you really just need the aerated teas. Val Spooner says, please help. I'm trying to find the video that Nate used the smaller bucket with holes for the cow manure inserted in the large barrel. Can someone direct me? It is the using fresh chicken manure in the garden video. Yes. In which, yeah, that's the way to go, guys. And how you make the, um, we essentially make like a well for the JLF. Because if you guys have like chicken manure JLF, which is another awesome one to make, or any manure JLF, uh, any of the JLFs, you'll, you will immediately find, wow, removing it is a little bit difficult. So um, I come up with a way to make essentially like a well. You just take like a five gallon bucket, drill a bunch of quarter inch, uh, holes around it and then put a paint strainer uh, over the bucket and then slowly submerge that into it and let it seep in through those holes and then what's inside that five gallon bucket you have uh, an open well basically you can scoop right out of that it works really good uh, 
Hanan Rafiq says, how to judge what your plants are lacking. I use cabbage JLF on my tomato plants, but saw calcium deficiency. Yes. So that's the key, guys. That's really what separates the master growers from the uh, everybody else, is being able to read the plants, being able to uh, see what the plant needs. And once you practice this long enough, and intensely enough, in my case, then, uh, then um, you will know immediately what, what the plants need. You'll know what a lack of calcium looks like, you know, and you'll know what an abundance of calcium looks like. So it's very important. Um, the blossom end rot and stuff, I think that's what you said on the tomatoes, right? Um, so, okay, yeah, so you said calcium deficiency. So on the tomatoes, so you um, need a high amount of calcium for blossom end rot. Really, as much calcium as you can get in the soil is good. It's a very heavily used uh, element and you can't overdose on it, for the most part, within reason. Uh, so the more calcium you have, the better. It's gonna make the leaves thicker and, and more uh, robust to pest and disease. It's gonna make the fruits last a lot longer uh, after you pick them. If you guys have produce that is like you pick and just immediately it starts to rot, uh, it needs a huge amount of calcium, okay? So you can make the um, liquid calcium acetate from the video that I have. You could also use certain other things. Um, the ash, sprinkling the ashes is gonna work really good. Um, so, Jenia McD says, how, how would you use OHN? Which I assume you're talking about oriental herbal uh, something, uh, from, uh, K and F, which I don't really use that. I don't, I haven't really found a need for that. So, um, I don't really use that a lot. That's one of the very few things uh, that I don't use. Um, Hanam Rafiq says, how should I start a YouTube channel like yours? Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, the main thing is that you have to be very clear in your mission and you have to be very clear in your purpose. Uh, and then you have to say, okay, I'm going to make videos that are they entertainment videos or are they like knowledge videos? If they're entertainment videos, that's totally different, but knowledge videos need to be concise to the point. And I used to draw the videos out on, on like a dry erase board and say, okay, what is the overall point? What do I want the viewer to take away? And so how can you condense as much value into a short amount of time as possible? That, that's my mission. That's my objective for making videos. Uh, so cut out all the unnecessary stuff. People, they don't need to know, hey, so this is the type of potato. My grandpa, I remember back when I was a kid, my grandpa used to plant these and he, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's great for some people, but uh, that's not what I'm into. I don't like to watch that kind of video. Unnecessary knowledge. Just uh, totally unnecessary information, not knowledge. Um, and so instead, it's like, okay, here it is. Here's the point, And here's what you take away from it. Here's how you do it. Okay, we'll see you next time. You know what to do. I don't tell people, subscribe to my channel. So guys, please subscribe to my channel, please. You know, I, <laughs> I never say that in any of the videos. I never say subscribe to the channel because you already know what to do. Um... And if you don't want to subscribe, then don't. And if you don't want to watch the video, then don't. There's plenty of other ones, you know. But if you want to be a part of this, if you want to learn and you want to be part of the tribe, then it's right here for you. Alberto, $5. Thank you, my friend. Says, thrilled for the future of your business and our community. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. Both the monetary support and the spiritual, energetic support. That is inspiring to me. Uh, and, uh, yes, the Viking nutrients shipment is, uh, almost here. And so I'm going to mix it up and, uh, they will be ready for distribution. Uh, or this is just a small batch. It's just a small couple dozen uh, of the, the buckets and stuff. So if you guys are interested, you just let me know. I haven't done the math yet to find out the price point, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a all, so I'm going to mix it up with a cement mixer and then I'm going to put it into the buckets. And then, um, if you guys want some, you can contact me and I will ship it to you. But, uh, the shipping is expensive, you know, no doubt. And so this Viking granular, you know, we're still in the, um, beta phase of it, not because the recipe is in question. Cause that's 
already been perfected, but the distribution process is kind of like puzzling. Uh, and so, you know, and I'm just trying to feel out and see, is this even going to be worth, uh, doing it, So it, making the granular fertilizer, uh, thing, which I think it will, because so many people contact me, Hey Nate, uh, what's a, a fertilizer I can just purchase if I don't want to mess with making all these, I don't want to haul in trailer loads of manure and make all these disgusting smelling, you know, fertilizers and stuff, which I get it totally. Uh, and so if you're not into that, then that's what I'm making the Viking granular, um, nutrients for. So, okay, well, here's just a bucket. It's everything you need. Literally, you don't need anything else. The Viking granular nutrients and water. That's it. If you wanted to, an aerated compost tea on top of that will be very beneficial, very beneficial. Uh, but besides that, no, you could just get this bucket, sprinkle it on, and um, there you go. And you only use that kind of stuff up to two weeks before you plant. That's it. Maybe even at time of planting is plenty good enough. So, um, yes. Uh, Kermudge in Alaska says, we have limited greenhouse space here in Alaska. What is the smallest sized pots for tomatoes? Well, that, de that depends. So the, the tomatoes are one of the few plants that if you just, if the smaller the pot, the less it will produce and the smaller the plant will be. Um, but, uh, I mean, so my mom had, <laughs> so we you know, we're, we're doing, we're, um, because you, you know, you want your mom to have a good garden, especially if you're the Viking gardener, your mom's got to have a good garden. So, uh, the, uh, so we got these 150 gallon grow bags and, uh, cause we had a bunch of soil from somewhere that we could put in there. Good, you know, decent soil, uh, but it needed amended. And so I used the Viking nutrients in there and, uh, we put two tomato plants and a bunch of basil plants but two tomato plants in that hundred, it was either hundred or 150, I think it's 150 gallons. And, uh, and those tomato plants were the most magnificent tomato plants I ever saw. I, I've seen bigger ones, but these, the production of them was unbelievable. Just dozens and dozens. And we're talking Cherokee purple, which are, are a shy producer. The tomato is a very shy, the Cherokee purple is a shy producer. And yet there was just dozens and dozens of them all season long. And then I, I did a top dressing. So like about August, late August or, or September, when they start to die off, I did a top dressing of the Viking nutrients, the granular. And again, it just started, boom, new growth right out the top and new, new fruits. It was just, those were the craziest tomatoes that, that I'd ever seen. So we put two in a 150 gallon grow bag. That's absolute maximum. You know, that that's like, um, probably overkill. Uh, so I, I would say for good, healthy tomato plants, 30 gallon, 30 gallon fabric grow cloth grow pot would be what you would want. Um, because you can grow them in five gallon buckets, but they're just, they're just small and just kind of weakly. And, you know, in a small container, you don't want plastic sides and stuff. Get the cloth grow pot and don't move them. Let it be in contact with the earth and it will uh, establish capillary action with the earth. And it will also put down small roots down. Um, Big Will Dog says, Nate, would it be easier to not have to worry about shipping fertilizer for locals? Yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the word out to some local people. Um, but the thing is, my community is way bigger online than locally, you know? So, but yes, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So if I come by Indy or if you come up here at any point or something like that, then, uh, yeah, we can make that connect. Um, Tyson Clements says, thank you for dropping so much knowledge, bro. You the man. Thank you, Tyson. I appreciate that. And, uh, it just seems like the right thing to do. You know, when you've been gifted, uh, so many experiences in life and have knowledge, the, the right thing or the, the thing that feels most appropriate is to pass it on, doesn't it? Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> uh, Masabi Gal says, just got bootstrap short trays and cloth buckets. Hope they last. Yes, which brings me to another point. You guys last, man, I was really upset with the um, bootstrap farmer trays and how they were functioning. It was just terrible because 
th there's like an inch gap in between the tray and the, the so blah, 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 you remember from last week. And so I couldn't bottom water and that has screwed up my system. And for the first time in several years, I have like, you know, I had to top water. And so that's not how I do things. And so there's like green fungus wanting to grow on some of the pots and stuff. So, um, but then you guys told me last week that I was using the wrong bottom trays and I had to get the microgreens trays. So they just arrived um, a couple of days ago and it's the obvious choice. Bottom watering is once again happening. So it's gonna work uh, wonderful. So I'm still, I'm very happy with the um, two gallons, all right? Uh, RK, $5, thank you my friend, says a small thank you for all you do for the community. Help support the Viking. Thank you, my friend. Yes, anything that you guys do towards this channel is helping to support the expansion. If you guys left the channel right now and then came back in like maybe three to five years, uh, you, you would just be absolutely blown away at what's gonna happen. Uh, you will see, you'll say, whoa, I remember back when he was sitting in his little desk, uh, in this little house that he had uh, back then. But the... Um, Stephanie Stevens says, what size bags of your fertilizer and how much you add to the soil? I'm probably going to, um, I'm just going to distribute them in three and a half gallon buckets. I might do some like one gallon bags, you know, some Mylar bags possibly. Um, but the, the dosage is still sort of, we're still sort of working it out a little bit. Um, last year I, I used uh, probably towards the maximum end. Uh, and for many things, it was overkill. It was like, it's very rich. So, um, I, I'll, I'll come up with a dosing thing and, and it'll be either like with, uh, it'll be on the sticker that comes on the side of it. So I'll, I'll, I'll write out the dosing thing, but right now I'm doing it in like liters, you know, per like square, um, per bed and stuff. So it's working. I mean, that's all I'm gonna use anymore from now on. That's all I'm using is the Viking granular nutrients. I'm done hauling manures and all that kind of stuff, at least at this garden. At the Viking North Garden, uh, my uncle's place, then yes, we'll still be hauling manures because it's big. It's a, there's a lot of space and we're not gonna be, we can't be using that much. It's not for that kind of growing. The Viking granular is for, is for like small scale vegetable gardening, you know, or <laughs> high stakes gardening as well. Uh, that's where the recipe came from. So just had to adjust a few things uh, for the home garden. <clears throat> B. Hendrix says, I love when the tribe comes through and says the right thing and saves the day. And that's true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Uh, RK says, looking forward to seeing what you do with some acreage. Oh, absolutely, guys. It's going to be, it's just going to be fantastic. Yes, definitely. There'll be so many different things happening. So many, um, like proof, uh, you know, proof of functionality systems set up differently. So it's going to be wonderful. Um, so the, uh, <clears throat> Cyber search, $5 Canadian, thank you. What is that, like $1.50? I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you. Uh, at which point in a tomato plant's life cycle should you start adding calcium acetate? Sprout, indoor seedling, when transplanting out? Um, the, you typically, if you have a good sprouting mix, or if, if you did a good um, seedling mix, like you watched, I think I put out a video about it this year, um, or maybe it was a short, but if you put the 30%, 20 to 30% worm castings in to your seedling mix, that will be everything that you need. Um, so the uh, calcium will start when you, when you put it into the soil. Or if for some reason you have to um, leave it in the pot for a long time, but it's not really gonna kick up its calcium usage until it begins to fruit, or at least until you see the flowers. So definitely once you see the flowers, but um, you want it to get into the soil, you know? So the, um, once it's transplanted into the soil, the calcium is actually one of the ingredients that we add at a very particular point in the aerated compost tea recipe. So it's all in there. So even though I say the aerated compost tea is the only thing you need, it's actually a, a, a um, compilation, conglomeration of uh, many of the different things. Mm -hmm. 
Look to nature says, maybe by then I can get you some ducklings if brooding goes well in the future. Yes, I will accept. Um, so the, uh, <clears throat> let's see, VA Green says, Nate, would you be able to take a submersible pump home from Chattanooga? I've got several off of some Home Depot pallets I bought. Oh yeah? Uh, I would, yes. Yes, guys, I would. Uh, me and Jenny are driving down to Chattanooga here. Uh, we'll be there from like the 26th until the, well, not, not that long, but uh, we will be there. And on the 27th at the um, Crabtree Community Gardens in Chattanooga, I will be doing a J-Dom seminar. So it'll be from 4.30 to 6.30 or however long, you know, it takes. If, if, a, if you guys show up, I'm sure there will be, you know, talking and everything. Um, but yeah, we'll see where it goes and, uh, introduce some people to the JDOM system. And, um, yeah, so if you're anywhere close to the Chattanooga area, it'd be great if you came. And so that is on the 27th. That's, uh, I think a Saturday, 27th of April in, uh, the Crab Tree Community Gardens. And I'll be putting out more information here when it comes. Uh, I'm just a little bit, you know, I've got a lot of things, uh, correspondences going on. Um, VA Green says, good, I'll save the shipping then. Yes, definitely. Um, oh, Jay Dixon, thank you. Look, you're on it, man. So the, uh, yeah, current exchange, $5 Canadian is three sixty three. Wow, it's a, it's that low, huh? Um, yes, Alex Coonan, thank you. Glad the shallow bootstrap farmer trays work. They definitely do. Uh, so it's not going to be a problem. Even though they're all downstairs right now, I didn't bring them up. For some reason, uh, Casey uh, Chis Chisholm says, uh, "Most difficult things you have grown. Most difficult things that I've grown." Hmm. Here you go. Ah, yes. Uh, the most difficult, I'm sitting there trying to think, most difficult things I've grown, not really anything is that difficult. Um, um, I would say corn, probably. Corn can be the trickiest. It can be. Um, uh, ginger was at first, I mean, they're all kind of difficult at first. Okay, so ginger at first was very difficult. Onions at first were very difficult, definitely. Um, but then you just learn, you just learn. Uh, these flowers, the Cox, Indiana giant coxcomb, these are pretty difficult to grow. Uh, but still, once you learn what every plant likes and you, you develop your system and you, you understand the concept, you, you get behind the philosophy that the plant is just an expression of what is happening in the soil. So once the soil is right, meaning organic matter, microbiology, drainage, um, nutrients, uh, availability, all of these kind of things then pretty much whatever you put in it is going to grow, is going to thrive. So it's not going to, um, so you'll have like little learning errors or learning curves for like a season or two, but then you'll figure it out and uh, you'll be growing everything with, with ease. I, I can't really think of it. What's you guys' most difficult things to grow? Uh, and then we'll see if that rings a bell with me. But off the top of my head, I can't think of anything. Here's one thing you want to start, definitely, uh, celery, guys. Celery is one of my favorite things to grow because one, it is so much more flavorful and full of nutrients than stuff you get from the store. It's not as huge and thick and full of water. It's smaller and tougher, definitely, but the flavor is so much different. So celery from the store can kind of taste like soap, if you know what I mean. Uh, but the homegrown celery in nutrient-rich soil is just delicious. And so um, I've got about eight of these little bunches that I uh, start the celery in and then I'm going to take these and just plant them. You can plant them in a, in a, um, a block or you can plant them in a row. Put about one foot in between each, each little because this is actually like six different celery plants. Put about 18 inches even between each one if you put them in a row. Um, and these are going to grow up and then you will cut from the outside and they will regrow. So you just don't cut the heart out. 
But even if once it's established, even if you cut the whole thing to the ground, it'll all grow right back. So once these have been in the ground for like two months, even if you take the lawnmower over the top of them, they'll all grow back. Uh, but celery is just a wonderful cut and come again thing. All summer long, we're adding this to the juices. Guys, especially men, you want good nitric oxide production in the blood. And so for that, you need uh, things like celery and beets. And so we drink uh, juices from the celery and the beets and tomatoes and uh, all kinds of stuff. Shijimisa, leafy greens, all summer long. Um, Christina says, oh, okay, I was gonna separate the celery. I have a similar planting. Yeah, I found over the years there's not a need for it. You can separate the celery and stuff, but it doesn't really give you anything unless you wanted to harvest market garden style, where you harvest the entire plant and take it to market. Put it in a rubber band, you know, like that would be different. But for the home gardener for that's just going to be consuming it, I like little tufts, little little colonies of it. Boom, 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 like that. So um, it's it's really good. And and they they're a leafy green, so they like good nutrition. So give them good rich soil, not overly rich, but um, you know, we're probably going to add about three tablespoons, maybe a quarter. Uh, Maybe two, yeah, we'll have to see. Between two tablespoons and a quarter cup of uh, the Viking granular per tuft, you know, like that. Probably a quarter cup to be safe. And that'll be it for the whole season. Just a quarter cup, quarter cup, quarter cup, like that. And last year they grew crazy, just super vigorous, super big, super full of flavor. Let's see, I got a uh, donation up here, I think. The, uh, yes, Taylor Reindel, $10, thank you, my friend. It says, picked up some purple Viking potatoes yesterday. So excited. Yes, this is the first year that I ordered some purple Viking potatoes as well. I mean, because how could you not? They they have my brand. That's Those are, those are our potatoes. So, Kim Williams says, oh, got to stretch. Kim Williams says, planted out my Tahitian melon squash today. So excited to see them grow. Yes, and you will be equally as excited uh, months and months later when the produce is still super fresh. Now, they are getting a little bit uh, desiccated at this point, but, I mean, we are in April, so they stay by themselves on the shelf all winter long. So guys, if you want um, some of these, we'll be sending them out with the Tahitian, or with the Egyptian walking onion uh, orders. So if you guys want those, remember, you can do the research and see how amazing the plant is. Um, we will be doing a one-time sale uh, of the Egyptian walking, the Valhalla rowing onions uh, come September. So if you guys want them, you have to give the deposit of $40 and you have to give me your address. So utilize the links in the description. PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App is the best way to do it. Or you can send it over the mail uh, to the PO box, but I prefer the electronic ways. Um, and that will get you on the list. And so, cause we're only gonna take a certain amount of orders. And uh, then we will, in September, we're gonna ship them all out. And we will, uh, we will put in that some Tahitian melon squash seeds, okay? So if you guys want some Tahitian melon squash seeds from the Viking Garden, then uh, let me know. And that's, um, we will give them to you, okay? Oh, look at this, Gary Smith. Thank you, my friend. Uh, oh. I didn't you okay i'm not going to say your code name but thank you very much i appreciate it. this is a good way to do it M made a 30 dollars donation through the paypal to support the cause thank you very much this is a great way to do it because we get to keep everything uh so says uh love the worm video shared videos with my nephew he says he has seen you also live in fort wayne that's cool uh yes tell him to say hi next time no problem yeah, I was at Costco the other day and I saw these people staring at me and stuff and, and then I saw them again staring at me and I was like, okay, what, what is the deal? And uh, I, I like waved at them like, hey, I see you're staring at me. And they were like, hi, we love your videos. I was like, oh, okay, cool. They said, we had no idea you were in Fort Wayne. Small world, small world. Um, ha, Pilar says, that gourd looks like a musical instrument, like a sitar. Yes, definitely. It's um, full of food and um, nourishment and amazing at storage. 
Think about when we don't have the refrigerator or the, or, or the um, freezers. The, the question for our ancestors was how to store stuff for the time when they're not growing. If you live in a place like Northern Indiana where nothing is growing over the winter time, uh, the question is how to store. So these were like a gift from the heavens uh, that they just, they have their own packaging and they store by themselves just sitting out all winter long. And so you've got nourishment between these and the butter balls uh, and the um, dehydrated peppers. You know, we got so much stuff. So, okay, have I made my point with this thing? Can I put it down now? So, um, yes, so, ha, Big Wes, I see that. That's funny. Um, Creative Soil says, I sent in my 40 for the onions. Oh, okay, good. Well, I'll make sure uh, I'll let you know when I get it. And yes, when you get the onions, one time is all that it's going to take. Uh, so you'll get a batch. And from that, you will be able to grow thousands and thousands at, over the course of several years. Because like I said last time, the original, um, the original batch of these uh, Egyptian walking onions came to me from the Buddhist monks at the Indiana Buddhist Temple. They just gave me one handful, said, hey, uh, here, put these in your garden. I was like, oh, okay. And, whoop, and I wasn't even uh, making videos. I didn't even have a YouTube channel at that time. And uh, they just gave me the one handful. And he was like, put these in your garden. So, okay, sure. I put them in there and then like neglected them. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, that's right. They came up in the following spring. And then they grew these crazy heads on them. Boom. And I was eating them and stuff. And then the next year, there was like just tons of them all over the place. And I was like, oh, I need to like get rid of some of these somehow. So then I took them out to my uncle's. And uh, in just a few years, uh, we have multiplied them. So all from that one handful from the monks. So that's kind of cool. So the, uh, let's see here. We got a, uh, sorry to be on my phone guy. I, I, you know, I don't want to be like on my phone, but um, yes, Freebird, thank you, my friend. $20 says you're the best, Nate. Thanks for all the channels and the help. Yes, you are welcome, my friend. Glad to see you here and thank you for the contribution. And Freebird is a frequent flyer of the uh, Thrive Like a Viking channel, where every Monday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, we do a live Q&A, um, live discussion more about all sorts of things related to thriving in your life. Growing your own food is one part of it, but there's actually much more to fully actualizing your experience of this life. And so that's what we talk about. Uh, Garden Queen, $10. Thank you, my friend. Says, hi, Nate. I've been binge watching all your YouTube since I broke both heels. Ooh, quick recovery, my friend. Let us send Queen, uh, Garden Queen some healing energy. Uh, this is my first live view. Random question. Where did you get your indoor grow tent? Yes, that's not random at all. That's actually very important because the indoor grow tent is game changing. Totally game changing. So please watch my... Um, seed starting masterclass video and uh, there's links in the description of these videos like this video right here right now if you go into the description of it go down I got all kinds of links in there but if you'll go down and you'll see the grow tent uh, setup I put all the links to everything that you need two different sides sizes of grow tents there's one big grow tent if you want to go big um, that's the one that I have well I have both but uh, the big grow tent so that's for starting up a lot of stuff, but there's also a smaller one. It's three by three by six, okay? So it's actually really tall, but what we do with that one is we lay it on its side and then we put the lights here so we can fit about six or eight trays uh, along there. And that's a lot. So um, yes, links are in the description of the videos. And if all else fails, the Amazon storefront. But guys, I'm not liking the Amazon storefront. I mean, it's just so hard to navigate, but what would really help the channel? Listen, if you guys wanna help the channel, um, one good way to do it is by using the Amazon storefront link to shop on Amazon. That's all you gotta do. Just go into Amazon through that link that I put right, it's like the top link in the video description. If you use that link and then go into Amazon, anything that you purchase while that window is open, uh, goes towards the channel. I get the credit, which it's a small commission, but at least it's better than Amazon getting it, keeping all of it. So uh, 
it doesn't, it doesn't have to be something that I put in the storefront. So for you guys that shop on Amazon, do all your shopping. Just save that link or just come to my video. And so anything that you buy through that link goes towards the channel. Let's do that, okay? Because Amazon doesn't need any more money. So, uh, and it doesn't cost you anything. So please. Uh, yes, Claire definitely says, I help the channel so much, Nate, and my garden looks great. Yes, you do. Thank you very much, Claire. And your garden will continue to look good, definitely. Uh, Heather Fox says, the one with the brown sugar and fish fertilizer. What about it? Um, the, uh, let's see, I can't see if you had any, okay. Oh yes, Heather Fox says, my son's brought me fish today. Guess what I'm making? Oh yes, that's the one. That's really the one that you want. Jerry Jr., it's 10.30 a.m. Eastern time on Monday, yes. Uh, P. Morton says, can't even get my regular onions to germinate so far. Garlic, chive, and even spinach is doing well, though. So you might be using old seed. Remember that about onions, guys. Onions are the most oxidizing of all of the seeds. So the onions will uh, oxidize, and pretty much after the same year, or after just one year, they're no longer good. Um, cause they have a very, very thin skin and so they oxidize easily. And, uh, the reason for this is if we look to nature and we see how they do it, cause the onion will grow during the, the spring and in the summertime, then it will flower and then fall to the ground. And then it immediately begins to grow more so that it can go dormant over the winter time. And so the onion seeds in nature, they don't have to wait a full year like most of the other seeds or many of the other seeds. They fall to the ground and immediately want to start growing. That's why they're not designed to, um, to uh, last that long. Yeah. Uh, Masabi Gal says, how do you grow artichokes? I've never grown artichokes, so I don't have any knowledge about that. Um, Yeah, Garden Queen says, great answer, and I will check out check that out. I have shopped on Amazon via your link. Hope you are getting the, the credit, the money. Can't see it on my end. Yes, if you use that link, I am getting it. So thank you. Yes, Big West, that's right. It says, enter through the Viking portal and buy whatever, but use Nate's link, and it favors him. Yes, thank you. Yes, Richard Hoof says, so if I use your storefront and purchase a different dehydrator than the one you offer, you will get the credit? Yes, if you purchase anything. If you go into the storefront and you're looking at the dehydrator and you decide to buy um, you know, soap instead, I get the credit. So anything that you buy while that browser window is open, we get the credit. So let's do it. Um, Ooh, Hilda Phillips says, question, I have a four-year-old four-foot yerba mate tree. How should I harvest? That's a great question and one that I would love to have experience with, but we do not live in an area that can do that, that can grow mate. Uh, even though I drink lots of it, no. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, Relic Scavenger says, are my questions not showing up? I guess that answers that. Um, let's see. Yes. Thumbs up everybody. Alberto $5. Thank you again. My friend says thinking of using potash for my potatoes. Should I use langbanite instead? What is an equivalent viconic viconic? What is an equivalent viconic nutrient cocktail I should use? Okay. One second. So there's several different schools of thought uh, on that as far as what to use on potatoes. Now, potatoes, <clears throat> so the, um, I also see one from Teats Treats, $2. Thank you for the contribution, my friend, but I don't see a question with that. It just says, let's celebrate their super or the first super live on a chat. Thank you. 
Um, so Alberto, should I use Langbanite? Langbanite is a wonderful thing. A wonderful thing to use, definitely. Uh, it can get a little bit pricey. So the prob, the not problem, but the thing with using dry granular nutrients for potatoes is that it can quickly add up the cost because potatoes are very hungry. And so if you're using like Viking granular, for example, even though that's what I'm using for my potatoes this year, um, I'm doing it more as just a test because some people might want to use it, but you, you will quickly, um, you need something a little more economical for potatoes or you can, I mean, it, it just depends. But if you want to grow the most nutrient dense ones possible, yes, you're going to want a combination, feather meal, bone meal. I mean, uh, the big combination, um, Langbanite can be one of the good ones, definitely. But, um, that's when we want to use natural things. Manures are very good. Uh, in particular, horse manure is key. Horse manure for potatoes, composted horse manure is the king for, for potatoes, really. Uh, not much else would need done. But if you need to buy some kind of bag of something, you can get, um, gran you can get the pelletized alfalfa from like the tractor supply store. Um, it's still going to be 30 bucks or 30 or 40 bucks, you know, for a big, huge bag of it. Um, so, I mean, that quickly skyrockets the cost of your potato production. But if your goal, you know, there's different kinds of people with different goals. If your goal is to, um, grow because you have no money and you want to just save money, then that's a particular type of growing. That's what all the J Dom is for and stuff. Um, but then there's like the people that, their focus instead is not on the money, but it is on growing the most nutrient dense food they can possibly grow free of all kinds of chemicals, the highest quality, highest vibrational, most flavorful, all of that. That's the goal. And so they don't mind spending some money. Uh, and that is where, um, so that is where the dry nutrients will come into play is when you want to grow the, the most flavorful nutrient dense stuff. Um, Yes, look to nature, says Relic. He's not ignoring you. He's getting bombarded with questions. Just keep asking. Um, yes. Yes. Um, but see, but see, it's just like fishing. I just look and then, but the questions are boom, 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 boom. And there's a lot of talking between each other, which is awesome. But yeah, you guys know. So yeah, I'm definitely not ignoring anybody. Trey Cannon, $10. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Says, let's celebrate their first super on a live stream. Okay, we celebrate. Okay, so the, uh, let me shut my phone off here. Okay, uh, let's see here. RK says, high phosphorus and calcium for big potatoes. Definitely. I mean, if you wanted to go, if you really wanted to, to do it right, then, um, some of the alfalfa meal, uh, some of the, um, uh, bone meal. Well, I'm, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not going to get into that because dry nutrients guys are tricky. You can easily throw, the, they're so concentrated. You can easily throw the balance of the soil off. And, uh, so they're way trickier to use than like manure or compost. There's virtually no for compost. There's no risk. You can grow in pure compost. Um, so that's why it's really good, but you can't, you can easily overdo, um, granular nutrients. So that's why I'm not even going to really start talking about it. Um, oh, Jay Dixon. Thank you. My friend says teeth treat did a donation. Then the question followed. Okay. Uh, I have onions that didn't do well last year, but, uh, well, let's see. Let me, let me see real quick if that was uh, what you're talking about. Jay Dixon, man, you're just a moderator at heart, aren't you? Thank you. Uh, okay, yes. So you did. You reposted the question. How thoughtful. How? Thank you. Uh, Teats Treats. Uh, I have onions that didn't do well last year but are doing well now, although they're starting to flower. Should I cut them down and eat a small bulbs or do I write it out? Okay, so if they're start, yeah, and that's the thing, guys. Remember, an onion is a biennial, meaning the first year it produces all of its vegetative growth, and the bulb is actually, we count that as that. And then the second year, it will focus only on flowering. The only purpose of its life is to get that seed into the ground. 
is to get that seed out there. That's the only focus of its life the second year. So um, that is one reason that onion sets often have a high failure rate because they're already in their second year or moving into their second year. And so they, most of them want to flower. So if you grow onions like this, guys, you should not, I, I will not get a single flower stalk out of these because these are in their first year. So there will not be any onion flowers from this. So to get onion seeds, I will plant um, onions from last year. And uh, then I will get the seeds for this year. So um, what I would do is uh, you can actually, so I don't know how many you have teats, treats. We're going back to that question. I don't know how many you have, but um, you can eat the stalk, although the flower stalk gets fibrous really quick. So you can try and cut it off, yes. If there's leaves, you can cut those off. The leaves will remain tender, but the flower stalk will, will get fibrous and tough and it will be unpleasant to chew. But the flower itself, if you have a bunch of the flowers, before it sets the seed, before, the, before it starts to die back, once it's like, before it's been fully pollinated, because each, the, the onion flower is beautiful, it's just magnificent, because each uh, little flower is an onion seed, and each one has to be pollinated. Hundreds, I mean, uh, tons and tons of them. So, um, uh, before they are all pollinated and then the flowers drop off while the flowers are still there, or even once they just start to open, once they fully open, cut it off and fry it. It's so good. You can either, you can, if you want, you can batter it and fry it. But the way I do it is I just take them, uh, as soon as they have fully opened up, boom, and they've got a little bit of pollinator activity, I'll cut that off and I'll take those and I'll just sprinkle them. And it's like a combination between onions and garlic and chives and just amazing flavor. The way to use onion blossoms for, for cooking, guys, and listen up, because I'm not gonna do many cooking, probably any cooking videos this year, but the way to do onion blossoms is uh, to have your bed of oil. So um, depending on the dish, it could be olive oil, but I use typically lard and tallow. I've got tubs of lard and jars of canned um, tallow, and that's primarily what I use. Um, and so I will have like lard or tallow and get that nice and piping hot and then sprinkle those onion flowers in there and let that marinate, let, let that uh, infuse the oil with the flavor until they start to pop. That's what you want to do. Uh, and, and so, oh man, it, it takes maybe a minute, you know, stir, stirring it like that. And that is going to infuse all that oil, that lard, especially if it's good pastured hogs, like where I get mine from, my buddy, uh, then, oh, my mouth's starting to water. Because then whatever you put in there, if you want to fry some strips of beef, or if you want to fry uh, whatever you want to do with it, if you want to fry a patty pan squash face side down, then that's going to be amazing, okay? Because that oil has been infused. So the... Um Let's see. Um, yes, thank you very much, my friend. A Tigris Custom Design, thank you. Uh, $5 via PayPal says, just because I would also like to be on your list for your granular fertilizer and walking onions. Okay, definitely, uh, we can do that. So the uh, granular fertilizer, we will. I will come up with that. Just stay tuned for that, because uh, you know we're in the developmental stages of figuring out all of that as far as the cost and distribution. So stay tuned for that. Um, but the walking onions, at any point, if you just wanna use the same PayPal thing, $40 and give me your mailing address where you want them mailed and you will be on the list. But you have to reserve your spot because we are gonna cut it off at a certain point because there's only a certain amount of walking onions. But at this point, we still got space. So, um, Muddy Paws says, I would love to have a Nate Viking cookbook in my library. Man, you're not kidding. That is coming. Someday that is absolutely coming. Definitely. Because cooking really is my passion. Really. To, it's, to me, the growing is... I, I, I cook so from scratch that I cook from the soil. I cook from before it's soil, even. I cook from the compost. You know, you, you, have to, you have to see what goes into your compost, the nutrients that go into the soil and how they affect the flavor. That's how from scratch I'm talking about cooking and what I do uh, cook. So you, um, you uh, 
yes. I, I mean, but it's not going to be on this channel. Those cooking videos just tank the analytics of the channel. So I'm just not going to do any more this year. So uh, at some point though, when I get a crew, you know, in the next three to five years, when the land is here and everything, will the kitchen will be made for videos. I mean, the whole place will be made for videos. And so we, uh, we will, and in-person stuff, but uh, we'll have maybe a separate channel when I can have people to edit that and just do that. And I can just be the, the personality, then we can do that. No problem. Because uh, tons of cooking stuff. I mean, literally, I, I have hundreds of cooking videos uh, uh, on deck. But um, right now, it's not going to happen. Lita knows says from soil to supper. I like that. Definitely from soil to supper, supper, supper. Um, Relic scavenger says I experiment with different methods of using my urine. I have sawdust soaking in it. What would be the best use for this mixed with compost? Soaking sawdust in urine is a fantastic uh, way to help it break down much faster. So yes, you can mix with the compost. Because the issue with sawdust um, and any high carbon source is that it, it doesn't, uh, well, let me just start back. So, because you have to know the method by which this works, all right? The, uh, when things are decomposed, like in compost, for example, uh, it's primarily bacterial dominant uh, uh, activity. And so the engine of decomposition is the bacteria. The gasoline for that engine is nitrogen. And so the stuff is going to be broken down no matter what. And so the bacteria will need nitrogen in order to, to break down the carbon source. So um, if you have like a sawdust or wood chips and you mix it into the soil, then the bacteria in the soil is going to temporarily suck up tie up the nitrogen that is in the soil to decompose the carbon source. Now, some people say this is a myth. This is not a myth. This I've seen this so many times functioning. Uh, this is real. It doesn't, it doesn't suck it up magically out of the soil, but anywhere that it is in contact with the soil, that tiny little, you know, micrometer of, of soil is the, the, the nitrogen is being, um, tied up. And so uh, this is why we never want to till in pure carbon sources, leaves, straw, um, sawdust, wood chips. That's where you run into problems. So many people, I tilled in a bunch of leaves and straw. Oh, okay. What night did, did you also till in a bunch of chicken manure? Did you also till in a bunch of, of, uh, of um, green manure of alfalfa or crimson clover? Hopefully. No. Oh, okay. Well, keep me posted on what happens without fail, because I already know this, because I've already done it over the years, without fail, they will plant into that and their plants will just sit there and do nothing. And they'll start to turn yellow and they'll just be blown away in the wind. And it's such a sad looking thing because uh, so many back to Eden gardeners, uh, and, and how many of you have experienced this? So many of the back to Eden gardeners that uh, have not properly conditioned the wood chips and the soil, lay down a bunch of wood mulch and then they plant their stuff into it. And then you just see these tiny little sticks with the little, little yellow leaves. You know, these are my pepper plants. I planted 40 pepper plants and they're all just this little stick with these little yellow leaves just kind of blowing in the wind uh, because there's no nitrogen source. Nitrogen is so important. Uh, and so then a lot of people will, uh, well, several years later then the back to Eden can be working right because it has the time to decompose. So all that to say that uh, you don't want to mix in the carbon source with the soil. If you are going to use it, you want to layer it on top of the soil. Okay. Like nature does. That's very important. Um, so with the sawdust, I would mix it in with the compost and compost it in the compost. Don't keep it separate. There's no need to keep it separate. I would add that all into the compost. Um, <laughs> look to nature says, I hope he's not talking about me in a month. Come back to the, uh, send pictures to the discord guys. If, if this is, if that happens to you. Okay. So join the discord chat, put all kinds of pictures of your garden. Uh, we all want to see it. Okay. So, uh, if you need my attention in the discord chat, you have to mention me because there's so many things now it's that I can't, I mean, I can't possibly, you know, 
see everything. Uh, so mention me in there. But if it's a question about something, keep it to the to the comment section on the YouTube videos because that's where we make the money and that's where we need the engagement. So um, if you have questions, even if it's not related to the video necessarily, you can just ask it in the comments. Okay. Cowgirl in Arizona says, "How does one get on the Discord?" In the link of this, in the in the description to this video, there is links, and you will see it says, "Join our Viking Discord community." It's free, uh, and I'm new to it, but it's like a chat room for the Viking tribe. It's super cool, actually. And some of you are very active on there, um, and some of them uh, have a lot of knowledge. Look to nature, and so, uh, and. Um, a lot of other people have really good knowledge on there. So you can ask questions and the tribe can say, okay, well, this is what worked for me. Um, here is uh, some pictures of my stuff. Showing pictures is super important. For me, it is. A lot of people will ask me questions, you know, why are my pepper plants turning yellow? Okay, well, uh, you know, send me pictures because it doesn't know, I don't know what the soil looks like. I don't know what their, their light looks like. I mean, what have they been fed? All kinds of stuff. <sighs> So, um, let's see here. Julianne says, Nate, can you make a slurry of comfrey leaves and pour in your garden for nitrogen? Definitely, yes. You can uh, make a slurry out of, um, those are going to be high nitrogen sources. So, if you guys are, now, after hearing me say that, describe why nitrogen is tied up temporarily by carbon sources. A lot of you are probably thinking, oh, is that, did I do that? And you're probably looking back and you're thinking, I tilled in wood chips or I, t I, I mixed in a bunch of leaves thinking that it was going to be, you know, beneficial. It's okay. Um, I know a lot of you are thinking that. So even after the chat, even after the live. So you can mitigate that with liquid. You can mitigate that to a degree with uh, liquids. So yes, make a straight up grass clippings, fresh grass clipping um, liquid fertilizer. And uh, just take straight up and the first, and we're coming into the time of year when it's best to use those grass clippings because the first couple of mowings is the most nitrogen rich of all. Of all. So uh, the grass right now is dark and rich. And so take all those clippings, stuff it into a barrel, Fill it to the brim with uh, the water and stuff and, you know, take a, a pole and just make sure it's all mixed up in there. Keep it covered. Keep an airtight cover on it. It is going to reek very quickly. It's going to reek. It's that ammonia evaporating and stuff. So you want to keep that airtight lid on there. And then uh, just after a few days, it will be enough of the nitrogen will have saturated and leached into the water that you can use that water to then put onto your... Um, your nitrogen hungry bed or whatever it is. So that's how you want to do it. If you're worried about it, make a high nitrogen source of liquid fertilizer. The high, the easiest, highest nitrogen is going to be those fresh grass clippings, but you can't let them dry out because the nitrogen evaporates. So dried grass clippings don't have the nitrogen in them. They're basically like hay or straw. So um, you're not going to get that same effect. You want to capture that stuff before it evaporates. So if you've got a bagger, dump that whole bag into a barrel and then put the, the, um, the water in there. And you can put leaf mold in there as well or some compost, do that as well. Put some compost in there. Uh, the, uh, all of that will be really good and then strain it out and dump it on there. Yes, Linda B says, new gardener here. I have kitchen scrap compost that has a gazillion worms in it. What do I do? Uh, the, uh, that's a wonderful thing. That's uh, So if you have kitchen scrap compost, you have composting worms in it. And um, the recent worm farm video that I made, check that out, definitely. Uh, those are composting worms. A lot of people don't know yet that there is a difference between composting worms and earthworms, and there's many different kinds of worms, but the composting worms are the kind that will be eating uh, the plant matter that are going to be composting. So those are the ones that, that you pick up a, 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 some, a handful of your compost, and there's just hundreds of worms off of it. That's going to be the wigglers or, or uh, certain varieties of that. There's not going to be earthworms eating those. 
So uh, what you can do with it is just let them compost everything and use the compost for the aerated compost tea that will be coming. The video will be coming in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Jamie Copeland says, do you have to dilute the grass clipping water or just straight? Um, it's best to dilute. Yeah, it's best to dilute. I mean, you could do straight, but you typically don't need to do that because it, it'll be very potent. You don't want to throw things out of whack. So uh, dilute it, you know, one to five, something like that. Make it nice and strong. You can even put in some of the urine. Start saving your urine. If you're like me, you, you produce about a gallon a day of urine. And so um, utilize that. Pour that in there as well. And you just tell your neighbors it's apple juice. They don't have to worry about it. Let's see. Alex Becker says, what would you use old honey for in the garden? Korean fertilizer? I extracted it from old brood frames a couple years ago. I have plenty of good clear honey for eating. Okay, so I, I imagine that you're talking about the dark brown stuff that is... Uh, got a lot of uh, the like the propolis in it and stuff like that or a lot of the wax in it and stuff because honey never goes bad as i know that you know if you're raising bees you know honey never expires so uh there really isn't there really isn't a um a use for it in the garden that i'm aware of because why because it's so precious you would want to consume that in some way um but if you had to I can't think of it. I would just feed it back to the bees. Yeah, I would just feed it back to the bees. So, um, or yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure hummingbirds love honey water. Uh, Val says ladybugs love honey water. That's cool. So yeah, you could do, you could use that. Do it that way. Um, <laughs> Mick Hager, Mick, thank you, my friend. Fifty bucks. Appreciate the contribution. It says, because you're the only one I can talk to about urine. LOL. Yes, thank you very much, my friend. I appreciate you. And uh, I'm serious about uh, coming out to Colorado sometime. I I'd be willing to do that just because of how awesome that would be. And, you know, when the time is right, just let me know. And uh, when the time is right, I can come out. I can help you guys get a game plan going or we can brainstorm about your property and what to put where and all that kind of stuff because... Uh, Mick just got a great new property. So, um, yes, we can do that sometime. Uh, cowgirl in Arizona. Can you make fish fertilizer with honey instead of brown sugar? No, we cannot. Because of the osmotic pressure. And I'm sure that we, uh, that maybe I talked about that last time, maybe. But uh, the osmotic pressure is why in K and F we always use brown sugar. We actually never use honey or molasses. Um... And so you uh, need the brown sugar because um, the osmotic pressure, see, there's like solutions are always trying to reach equilibrium. And so the, um, uh, like this is how the plant, the plant utilizes osmotic pressure. And I've said this before, but just listen to it again. The plant draws up water and nutrients through osmotic pressure. It does this by maintaining a higher concentration of salts in the plant tissue than what exists in the surrounding soil. And so the law or the way that it works, the water is always trying to reach equilibrium, to dilute. So the water's, so there's a high concentration of salts here. The water is always trying to dilute that. And so it's going to draw that up into the um, plant. This is why nutrient burn, this is what nutrient burn is. And uh, we can find it in the natural sources like chicken manure, or if you utilize granular fertilizers wrong, you can do it, but definitely chemical fertilizers. What happens with nutrient burn is that the um, surrounding soil becomes higher in salt concentrations than the plant can maintain in its tissue. And so the reverse happens, and it actually draws water and nutrients out of the plant. And you will see this um, first, it will express itself on the furthest growing tips of the leaves away from the root that is that it, this is happening to yes um so that's how you can tell nutrient burn and it, it kills the leaves it, it looks like a dead leaf you know it looks like this even though this is not nutrient burn it looks like this um so osmotic pressure we need that to um draw the so we use the sugar and the sugar is what draws 
through osmotic pressure, what I just described, the enzymes and the proteins and the hormones and all the stuff out of the fish and out of the bones and out of the, all the other stuff. So that's very important. Yeah. <clears throat> Diod or Diod says, uh, how can I make mycorrhizal fungi at home? The only thing that can make and grow mycorrhizal fungi is a living root. That's it. There's no, I mean, contrary to what the marketing schemes and, and um, you know, fake YouTube videos will try to tell you, only a living root can multiply the mycorrhizal fungi. So what you need to do is get the mycorrhizal fungi from the high quality leaf mold. There's billions of mycorrhizal in, in, in the scoop of leaf mold, okay? So the, uh, what you can do though is use the leaf mold to, inno to make a solution and then inoculate the soil with that and then the plant will multiply the mycorrhizal fungi because you can't feed the mycorrhizal the specific kind of sugars that it needs. Only a plant can do that. And so um, th the best thing that you can do is get it in the leaf mold and then inoculate the soil with it and make sure that, the, that it is there when the plant needs it. So if you if you want to increase mycorrhizal fungi in your in your soil, utilize cover crops. Always have a living root in the ground. That's the best way to do it. Um, look to nature. Says the the root word of mycorrhizal means myco means fungi, rhizal means root. Exactly, root fungi. It only that's the only way. But a lot of companies will want to try and tell you, uh, you know, oh yeah, here's a, you know, you're going to increase your, brew this or, or use this. It's going to increase your mycorrhizal fungi. Not if you don't have a living root in the ground. And if you do, then you don't really need to worry about it because in one teaspoon of good quality leaf mold, there's all the mycorrhizal fungi spores you would ever need. Blackbird Schoolies, what's up my friend? Says Skull, my brother. Taking a quick break from working to check out the live, but me and the family will sit down and watch it together as we always do later. Yes, man, he's been sending sending me updates of his garden on uh, Instagram, and it's you're just now in this place, but that is a nice looking plot already. I'm liking it. I mean, you did it right. You got that one time till, put that landscaping fabric over it, burn the holes in there. You've got the uh, the um, trellis netting up on the T post. That's exactly how I would do it. So uh, good job on all that. Um, VA Green says, soil companies just using it as a selling point now. Oh, absolutely. Guys, it, it is so. It is a, just a sea of um, not, not really mis, well, misinformation, but also just like um, manipulated information. Just a sea of uh, manipulated information, you know, with mycorrhizal fungi and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay, well, it's just <laughs> without understanding how things work. Ooh, part-time Greek vegan. Yeah, you must be Greek because uh, when I was living in Greece, people would, the Greeks would correct me all the time uh, and say, well, no, actually that root is Greek. You know, so uh, if Turkish coffee, well, Turkish coffee is actually Greek. You know, I'd say, well, it's actually Greek. Everything was, well, that's actually, you know, that's actually Greek in origin, which is probably true. So, um, but yeah, it says both Myco and Ryza are Greek, not Latin though, just for accuracy. Yes, just for accuracy. Um, let's see here. Mandy Garrett says, question, did you receive my PayPal for walking onion? It's been about three weeks. Uh, I will check to double confirm, but if you sent it by PayPal, it's here. That there's a, that's why I like the electronic methods because it's for sure there's a receipt, there's a thing, uh, but I'll go through and check for sure. Next, next time, maybe I will um, have a list of everyone that is on the list, okay? Um, uh, Linda B says, I made your eggshell calcium and tasted it after a week. Is it uh, normal to taste a little like vinegar? Yes, it's normal to taste a little like vinegar. No problem. Yes. Alex Forgy, $10. Thank you, my friend, says, good morning, Nate. Uh, I take some meds. Is it okay to use my urine or no? And should I plant before I mulch or after? 
My plants are pretty small. I'll be putting them in around the 1st of May. Okay, so you take some meds. Um, it's, it's best to use, if you're taking meds, it's best to compost the urine first, to uh, ferment it. So, you, so watch my video on the urea fertilizer. That's why uh, J-Dom has, does it that way. So in the bucket with some leaf mold, um, but I have actually, and this is a secret because I'm going to make a video about it this year, but I have actually been doing the past several years adding rice wash uh, and labs occasionally to the, um, to the urine bucket. And it makes, it really takes a lot of the smell away, some, but uh, it, it just seems to work a lot more powerfully. So um, that's the best way to do it. So yes, you can use your urine. The main thing with the urine is I mean, tons of preservatives or tons of antibiotics, that's a problem, you know. So um, if you're on lots of antibiotics for something, wait until you're off of that to utilize the urine. Um, Kenny Martin, $10. Thank you, my friend. Says, did winter wheat and red clover mowed a patch for some onions and it was incredibly difficult to get through all the roots. Any suggestions? Soil was 12 inches deep and loose prior. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the thing though. So you probably, okay. So I just have to be straightforward with you here that you probably didn't watch my video about cover crops. Uh, because if you did winter wheat and red clover in an area where you're going to do a cold hardy vegetable, that's not how you do it. Winter wheat cover crops, pretty much if you're not going to green manure, it are only for heat loving stuff. Um, because you can't just cut it down and then plant right into it. You can't. Um, you have to terminate the winter wheat at exactly the right time. Otherwise, it will grow back. Um, and so unless you're going to um, green manure it, in which case you just till it all in. You just till, you just till everything in. So if you just mowed it down and tried to plant the onions into that, it's going to be a problem. That, there's not, there's no, that's not how you want to do it. So um, if you're going to plant stuff, if you're going to do no-till cover crops, you want to terminate it and then cover it with uh, either clear plastic or black plastic for several weeks until it all rots. It all terminates and, and rots. The roots, the fibrous root system will, will um, decompose in the ground. So uh, that is what we want. Um, guys, check these out. So we just started hardening off our uh, our uh, like brassicas and stuff. We got shijimisa over here. We got um, the komatsuna, Swiss chard, uh, cabbages, the glory of Einkusen, also the giant red mustard, which are super delicious. But um, yeah, these trays are working out really well. So these are being hardened off right now though. So we're taking them outside and uh, they're adjusting really well. So if they were wilted and if they were like starting to burn and get like white spots on them, then I would know that that was overboard, that I, I did, it was too fast. But do you see, these have been in the direct sun and there's not any sign of um, burning or wilting or any, these are super healthy. They're nice dark green because I've been giving them the seedling fertilizer, all that stuff. Um, so these we know are, are being hardened off properly. But if they're wilted and they're just like, and you see white spots, that's sunburn. Um, that's sunburn on the plants, okay? So the, uh, let's see here. Guys, I want to tell you one thing I love is this. Um, let me see here if I can pull it out for you. This red, ooh, ooh look at that roots coming out the bottom. Uh, is this red mustard. This is a giant red mustard. It gets like three feet tall, like three feet across. And these leaves are delicious. Stir fried. Uh, they're real spicy, mustardy, mustardy raw, but then when you stir fry them uh, with a little bit of a Thai chili pepper and some uh, little bit of vinegar, rice vinegar, and some soy sauce, wow, it really tones down the spiciness and makes it nice and delicious. And we just do it real quick on a high heat and the walk. That's what we do. Just real, the, the high heat walk is the way to do vegetables, guys. There's something about it that just, it's the way to do it. And so um, that's what these are really good for. And if you plant like four of these, that'll keep you with t tons all summer long. So um, th that is uh, one good thing. Yeah. And then I got to tell you, man, the shijimisa, if you guys are tired of spinach bolting all the time, then you need to get on the train of shijimisa. Okay. And uh, 
because it is so cold hardy and heat tolerant and delicious. It tastes just like uh, spinach, except it uh, doesn't bolt. And so that, that's the, the kind of the pain about spinach is uh, how, how easily it bolts. And you see these are ready to go in the ground. Once, once they really start coming out and you know that it's been in there long enough, probably another couple of days and these, the shijimis is gonna go right into the ground. But see, that's always a good sign. You got the nice, strong, healthy white roots. Um, if you've got issues, then they're gonna be brown. If the roots down here are brown, that means you've let them dry out. Uh, um, uh, even just one time, if they get bone dry, they will die. Or you had them um, in the water for too long. So that can also kill them out. But see how these are nice and healthy, thick white roots that are seeking out the, so uh, the uh, moisture in the soil underneath? That's what we want. Now, um, the glory of Einkusen is the best of the um, spring planted cabbages. So the, the glory of Einkusen grows really fast and uh, efficiently and tight heads. And they grow much faster than like the Brunswick cabbage. That's for the winter time, for the fall, all right? So the glory of Einkusen is going to be a really good one. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys those. So that's that's what you want to look for. When you're hardening off your stuff, you, you want to look, okay, well, I don't see any burn marks and I don't see any stress. I mean, every one of these, see how they're perky? Everything is planted, everything's pointed upwards. Everything looks good. <clears throat> Big Wheel Dog says, question. Um, I used year old horse grass leaf compost, extra worm castings and leaf mold for my potato bags on top of leaves. You foresee any nutrient problems? Um, year old horse grass leaf compost, extra worm castings. Um, no, I don't really foresee any problems, but I, I don't know how rich that horse grass leaf compost is. Um, you know, leaf mold is wonderful. It's not very high in in the NPK nutrients. It's great micronutrients, it's wonderful, um, but we need that nitro, we need the manure. So if you're in doubt, mix in, even though you probably already got them planted, you could mix in some um, alfalfa pellets, that would probably be the cheapest route, or just some chicken, just some manure of some kind, but you're probably fine, you're probably fine. Yeah, especially if you did worm castings, um, yeah. I would say you're fine. Um, someone asked for the spelling on those. Um, it, Shijimisa, yeah, it's it's um, C H I J C I M I S A, something like that. It's, it starts with C H, and there's a J in there somewhere. Mm. Oh yeah, Masabi Gal says, Nate, have you grown tatsoi, and what does it like? Yes. It likes the same thing as all of these other uh, greens. Tatsoi I grow as well, definitely. I've got some started and it is um, super rich in nutrients. Now, Shijimisa is, it's two parents are Kamatsuna, which I have right over there, uh, and Tatsoi. And so that, it's a combination of those two. So it has the hardiness of the, of the um, Kamatsuna and the flavor profile, the nutrient profile of the Tatsoi. So um, that's why I kind of just, and those for me are mostly fall time. I do grow a bunch over the summer, but I love the greens come fall time. Stir fries, stir fries all summer long, guys. Um, Yeah, Christina says, uh, I grew Malabar spinach last year. It does not bolt in heat. Yeah, no, it thrives in the heat. But to me, I just can't get over the sliminess. I, I, there, I could not find a way to prepare Malabar spinach that I cared to eat it. So, um, Part-time Greek vegan says, sigh. I guess I won't get an answer to my question today. See, if you would have just reposted your question instead of saying that, I would have read it. So, so just repost the question, guys. Okay, here we go. Question, part-time Greek vegan. For potassium needs, can I sprinkle some wood ashes and dig them in? Sorry if someone answered it and I missed it. Absolutely, absolutely. Watch the video that I made on how to utilize wood ash in the garden. I think I made it last spring. 
for, for the right ratios. But definitely, wood ash is one of the best things you can use for the garden. People have been using that for thousands of years. Uh, slash and burn agriculture was the sustainable way of doing things for millennia. And so um, the wood... The wood ashes have tons of minerals in it for the plants. So yes, very good. Um, potassium, yes, they definitely have good potassium in them. So yeah, yeah, you can do that. Don't go overboard, watch the video I made and do that ratio. <laughs> Pop Perm says, it feels like reposting seems desperate and needy though. <laughs> Guys, it's a live chat, come on. Um, <laughs> yeah, Pop Perm says, I don't know how to describe it. Selfish and overbearing to spam the question repeatedly. I get it. I get it. I, I appreciate that you're conscious about that. You know, but um, no, here it's it's all good. It's all if you watch other chats, guys, they're like super aggressive and just boom, 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 and stuff. I don't even know how they do it, but I'm happy with this tribe right here. Um Sound Min 7, uh, do you have a recipe for hydroponic plant juice? You know, I don't get into hydroponics anymore. I used to do hydroponics back when I was high stakes gardening, chemical farming, but uh, we don't do that anymore. And so all of these natural things, they need the soil food web. And so without soil, you're not gonna have the soil food web for the most part. Um, the uh, So I know that there are things that can be absorbed, but um, I, I just haven't invested because I, I really don't want to promote hydroponics because why, why? You know, there's zero advantage. Well, there can be, the, the argument can be made. There are some advantages in certain spots for hydroponics. It is much faster to produce, much faster to produce. Uh, and it tends to produce a bigger, fuller, heavier plant for market, you know? So, um, but, it's lacking, desperately lacking in the nutrient density. And I don't care what style, even Kratky hydroponics, I don't care what style of hydroponics, it's not going to compare to the nutrient density and the life force energy from the soil. And so uh, my suggestion, instead of going, and this is just my opinion and experience, instead of going deeper into hydroponics is to go switch to soil and to figure out what you gotta do to use soil. So that's, um, yeah. Um, so the, um, right. And uh, RK says hydro equals no taste. That's right, because there's no nutrients because the taste is a direct reflection. This is why we have, this, this is why we have one of the most sophisticated nutrient uh, analyzing devices is our taste before it was hijacked by the modern industrial diet and chemicals and designed to short circuit it the taste was indicative of the nutrient profile of the produce the plant or the fruit and so wow it tastes amazing because it's the innate intelligence in the body drawing us to the nutrients that are in that saying yes we need that yes meat would taste amazing the blood and the meat would taste amazing because we need those nutrients or the fruit would just taste so succulent and delicious because we need that and if it had no flavor well, we throw that out we don't need that so uh you can still utilize that once you reclaim your taste buds from the enslavement of the modern industrial uh diet yes but that's kind of a process so Guys, look at that. We are way over time. Why didn't you tell me? Uh, so, okay, guys. Thank you very much for everything. And I will see the Thrive Tribe uh, Monday morning at 10.30 a.m. on the, e on the um, Thrive Like a Viking channel. And I'll see you guys right here next week. Exact same time, same place. Uh, make sure you like the videos. Make sure you share them with people. Help the community to grow. And uh, make sure that you shop on Amazon through my storefront. Doesn't matter if you don't buy what's in the storefront. Just use that link to enter Amazon. So that way we can keep the commission instead of Amazon keeping it. Why not? Do you need to make Bezos more money? Not really. So, um, 
Shauna Suis says, I've been watching and listening and healing. Your voice and knowledge have been a huge part of my healing for many months. Just wanted to say thank you. Thank you very much, Shauna. And you have no idea how inspiring that is to me because uh, that is what it's all about. So thank you for sharing. And uh, Jinnia McDonald, $10 last minute tip. Thank you. Says, have a great week. You too, my friend. So uh, yeah, if you guys are watching this after the fact, uh, let me know what you have started, okay? Because we are one month before last frost here. And I want to see how many people jumped the gun. So, okay, guys. We'll see you next time.